All right, well, let's dive right into our presentation today. We're talking about Oracle licensing in AWS, breaking free from excessive costs because Oracle licensing can be a source of excessive cost in an AWS environment for shops running Oracle databases. And it's not always obvious to people how that happens or how they get in trouble. So I wanted to use this presentation to educate some people who might be thinking about going to AWS with their Oracle footprint on some of the fundamentals of Oracle licensing that they need to be aware of. And then a few practical tips I use to optimize licensing in an AWS environment. So let's dive right in. Uh, of course, you've got the intro slide. I think I'm required by law to have this. And this just talks about uh, the 20 year history that House of Brick has in helping our clients solve really thorny relational database problems. Uh, obviously, we do licensing and audit support on the compliance and governance side. We have some great tools for tracking licensing or cloud compliance with various security frameworks. And then we help people architect and migrate their uh, workloads into a public cloud environment. And sometimes also we deal with database modernization projects where we're implementing DevOps processes or, or even moving to open source engines. A lot of cool stuff we get to do there. So let's get into the licensing 101 is what I like to call this. Of course, I must start with a disclaimer. Uh, we are going to be talking about the Oracle contracts that govern licensing. And whenever you talk about contract stuff in one of these presentations, you've got to remind people, I'm not a lawyer or attorney, not giving you legal advice uh, specific to your circumstance. I'm just making general observations about what House of Brick has seen with our clients and throughout the industry over the years. I always like to start with this slide because it emphasizes a key point. Uh, if you talk to a lot of IT people and you say, where does your IT department spend the most money? Well, of course, the CIOs are going to know. You know, the budget officers, they're going to know this. But most people below them don't. Uh, they think, oh, well, boy, we spend a lot on servers or storage and networking or, or, or developers um, or, or operations people. But actually, the number one source of spend out of an IT budget uh, you can see the source I got this from. This, this data is a few years old, but I think it still holds true today. The biggest source is software. Paying big checks for software licenses, software license support, and update rights to various software vendors. This is a huge expenditure area, and knowing how to control Oracle licensing and then the licensing of that software can help you take a chunk out of that uh, big piece of the pie there. Um, and I, I wanted to show this to put this in perspective. This is a real slide I actually made for a customer several years ago. I've modernized it more recently. But this was in relation to a proposed uh, greenfield deployment of Oracle-based application stack in an AWS environment. They were looking at it and uh, I proposed an R58X large instance. I proposed a one terabyte, well, it was GP2 at the time, but I've updated the slide with GP3 pricing. Um, so kind of a largest compute instance, small database, very uh, concurrent, small data set, OLTP workload. And I was getting an awful lot of pushback on the compute size. Uh, I'd done the math and I said, you really need an R58X large. And and one of the DevOps people I was working with just kept pushing back saying, man, R58X large, that's going to break the budget on this project. And I just laughed at him. And I said, listen, you're not wrong. An R58X large is not the cheapest instance out there. But let's look at the big picture. Let's compare some numbers. We're talking about having to purchase new Oracle licenses for this project. You know how much those are? So I, I graphed it out for him. I, I, I ran the numbers. Uh, One-time license purchase price for an R58X large is $760,000 list price to fully license it. Uh, I'm trying to remember, in this case, I think it was Oracle Database Enterprise Edition. Maybe a few options like Diag and Tuning were in there, too. Of course, then every year you owe Oracle 22% of that original purchase price as your support payment for those licenses. And that does compound year over year. I don't have compounding in here. But uh, we come up with another half million real quick. Whereas uh, the three-year bill, and again, this is all full list price, U.S. East 1, U.S. dollar denominated, an R5 8X large would cost you about $53,000 for three years at on-demand pricing. One terabyte GPS, or sorry, one terabyte GP3 EBS volume, tongue twister there, 3000 bucks. It's, it's nothing. It's nothing. If you look at this, and the pie chart really makes it stand out, 
Oracle is getting all the money on this solution. And so if we want to optimize for cost, if project budget is important, and it should be, then that's where we look. That is the place where we can optimize. Optimize there first. A lot of people I don't think realize that, but that is very key to my approach to architecting Oracle solutions in a public cloud, is optimize for licensing first because that controls the majority of costs. Let's talk real quickly just about some terms you might need to know. When using Oracle licenses, uh, sometimes you hear about different metrics. Named user is one, processor is another. Um, a key point to understand is that all Oracle licenses at the end of the day, in some fashion, can be traced back to physical processors, with the exception of unlimited license amendments, which we'll, we'll touch on here in a little bit. So when you license by named user, you're, you're, you're doing what it says on the box, right? You're counting the number of people. Um, and you're not counting it in a technocratic, you know, how many connections to the database or how many different logins do people have to the database. It's actually simpler than that. You look at the database, you look at all the applications that connect to it, you look at all the people that use those applications, and you count them. You know, if, if it's everybody in your company, then that particular database needs a number of licenses equal to the number of people in your company, or the minimums required by the hardware it runs on. And that's the caveat that a lot of people miss. So there's a minimum number of users required per processor. And I'm actually going to be, make a distinction here because the way Oracle uses the term processor when talking about licensing isn't always the same way an engineer like you or me might talk about them. They're not talking about number of chips or number of cores or sockets or SMT or um, big little cores, you know, some of these concepts that are gaining traction now. When Oracle talks about processors for enterprise edition licensing, they're talking about number of cores times a core factor. Okay, pretty straightforward. And you would think that's not relevant to named user, but it really is. Because with named user licensing, there is a certain minimum based on the number of cores in a server. And it is more and more common, and I see this all the time with my clients, um, as, as servers have grown the core count over time, and, and nowadays you go buy a new server, it might have 24, 36, 48, maybe even more processor cores in it. it it's extremely common for the actual number of named users to be lower than the minimums the hardware requires, and so you end up licensing, even by named user, on processor factors. You don't have to count the people, um, I see this all the time when in non-production environments where there's a database dedicated to, let's say, a, a dev test environment. Uh, and there might be 20 developers, 10 testers, five automation engineers. You know, maybe we can count to 35, 40 people. But the thing's got enough cores that you need to use a minimum of 50 or 100 named user licenses to license it. And so it ends up being driven by hardware, not by the actual number of people. The other metric you hear about is processor, and this one is at least a little conceptually easier because it is, again, processor-based. So you take the number of processor cores that are present in a server, multiply by the appropriate processor core factor. Um, for the vast majority of us, that will be 0 0.5, which is the current multiplier as of this recording for x86 family processors, so Intel, Xeons, AMDs, etc. cetera. Uh, you might have a different multiplier there if you're using AIX, HPUX, uh, SunSpark, some of these other chip families that are out there in your more traditional big Unix boxes. But for most of us, it's gonna be that 0.5. Um, and once you've licensed the hardware for a server, then it doesn't matter how that's carved up. Um, you can carve it up with virtualization into five or 10 virtual machines, or you can run one operating system and no hypervisor. Um, in those virtual machines or on that one operating system, as many databases as will fit, right? You're, you're licensed all throughout the server once you've licensed a server. That's your traditional processor licensing. And by the way, that statement applies to the named user plus licenses I was just talking about as well. Uh, the only caveat I would offer there is that standard edition Oracle database is a slightly different weird metric where you count the number of physical chips or sometimes referred to as the number of processor sockets in the motherboard that are filled. Um, kind of a weird edge case, 
and you can't have more than two sockets in a server that's running standard edition and st standard edition nowadays has got built in internal limiters that prevent it from using more than 16 simultaneous threads of execution anyway. So it's not really a big, big deal there in terms of trying to find creative ways to optimize standardized edition. Most of the time optimization is around enterprise edition licenses. And one fact I want to call everyone's attention to, because it's going to be a theme throughout this presentation, both the processor licenses I'm talking about and the named user licenses I just talked about, they all tie back to processors, right? For, for whatever reason, Oracle has for decades traced all licensing back to processors. There's nothing about RAM, nothing about disk space, size, storage, anything like that. Um, it's always about processors. And that's kind of an odd thing when you think about it. If you're familiar with database optimization or tuning or, or the, the operation of relational databases, they tend to be primarily limited by the speed of their disk subsystem. I mean, they're a database. They're reading in and writing out large amounts of data all the time. So the limitation generally is not processor availability or processor cycles to do these things. The limitation is disk. The, the secondary limitation is memory because relational databases tend to use memory as a disk buffer. Buffer cache, disk buffers, there are lots of different terms we'll hear for this, but those are the two primary things that determine kind of how powerful a particular system will be for handling relational database workloads. Number of processors is pretty far down the list, and yet it's the licensable metric. Understanding that little disconnect there is going to inform a lot of my strategy for optimizing in an AWS environment or any public cloud environment. We're going to go over some licensing basics here real quick. Um, this is a topic I've given much, much longer talks on, and I'll spare you that today. The key thing is that your master agreement with Oracle, depending on how old it is, it might have a different name. The newest ones are called OMAs, Oracle Master Agreements. Um, it just has a sentence that says you must license, you must have a license wherever Oracle programs are installed and or running. Um, that used to be pretty darn straightforward in the old days of running on premises. You know, this was a server. I bought this server to run Oracle, installed an operating system. I installed Oracle. The end. Very straightforward. Things get a little confusing when you start mixing virtualization in there. And then they get more confusing when you start mixing in. Um, public cloud environments where sometimes it's very hard to know what the hardware is. And that we'll get into that here in a few slides, but this whole installed and or running and interpretations of that particular clause are the reason why you might encounter a lot of different takes on Oracle licensing. Why you might ask Oracle a question, you might ask me a question, you might Google something on the internet and come up with different slightly or even wildly different answers. It's because different people are interpreting that differently. Um, and knowing that it is a lot of this is an interpretation game and that you don't have to take Oracle's word as gospel truth. You can check the contracts yourself. You can read the relevant documents yourself um, and come to the right conclusions about how to stay in license and compliance. If, if you know which documents to read and you're thorough and do your homework, Though, of course, if you get into a tricky edge case, you're getting audited, I always recommend seeking expert assistance. So I said things got a little bit goofy when we go to the cloud. Let's, let's dive into that. The, the top document that I've linked here is a, the, the most current, as of 2021, uh, version of this. Whenever you read this uh, yourself, there may be a newer version. And this is what I call the cloud licensing policy from Oracle. That's not the official name of the document. That's just kind of what I refer to it as. Uh, the, the full name is uh, very long and probably was written by legal. It's something about authorized cloud environments and, and so forth and so on. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not a very long document. And it says a bunch of things about how you can license in a public cloud by virtual CPUs. You can start... And this is the first time Oracle has really offered this because, like I said, everything before tied to physical hardware in some way. But in a public cloud, Oracle knew you just wouldn't be able to guarantee which physical hardware you're running on. That's not how public clouds work. 
They're, they're very shared. Your, your instance could be running on any piece of hardware in a huge, huge data center, and you don't know, and you don't care because it's a public cloud. So Oracle realized they had to let people do this by virtual CPUs in a public cloud environment. Now, there's three things out of this document that I specifically excerpted, and I'm kind of starting in the middle here. The, the fundamental rule of Oracle licensing in a public cloud is count two vCPUs as one paper processor license, as, as one of these processor licenses that Oracle will sell you for Database Enterprise Edition or for various options or add-ons. With Azure, count one Azure CPU core is equivalent to one Oracle processor license. Um, and all this assumes hyper-threading is enabled with the Amazon side of this. Now, I'm going to call your attention to the disclaimer that Oracle puts in this because this scares and confuses some people. Uh, they, they put a little footer on this document that says this document is for educational purposes only. It provides guidelines regarding policies. It may not be incorporated in any un contract, and it does not constitute a contract or a commitment. So I've seen a lot of people read that and go, okay, Oracle published this, but the fine print says Oracle doesn't have to stick to it. Technically correct. However, um, I, I can offer two points here that, that should help you get over your fear there. One, House of Brick has helped a lot of customers move to the cloud, and we've helped customers running in AWS get through Oracle software audits. And we know from firsthand experience that Oracle respects their own policy here. It's not contractual. It's not part of anything you signed or agreed to, and Oracle won't make it a binding agreement, but they will respect it during audits. The second thing I've seen is I've, I've gotten the opinion from various, you know, legal counsel of the clients we've worked with, both in-house counsel and external counsels, more specialized in software law, that having made this grant this publicly, Oracle would not be allowed to say, nope, just kidding, and start you know, trying to take legal actions against clients for inappropriately licensing their Oracle software. They can't start raking you over the coals because you used the policy that they put out on the web for you to use. Um, and there would be legal recourse if they tried that. So the message here is don't get too wound up about that. This is a reliable policy and you should feel free to rely on it as you plan your migrations of Oracle database workloads into an AWS public cloud. And the last bit there, this is a, a very specific caveat, but it bites some people really hard, so I like to call it out. Um, if you have what's known as an unlimited license amendment, and I, I mentioned them earlier in the talk, and we'll, we'll give them just a brief coverage right now. If you're a very big Oracle customer, you might negotiate an unlimited use right to certain Oracle products with Oracle. And when you do that, there's almost always a time limit. Not always, you can get a perpetual ULA, but most of the time there's a time limit involved. This isn't, you can use this software all you want forever. It's, you can use it all you want for three years or four years or five years. And at the end of that, we're gonna see how much you're really using it, maybe negotiate an extension, um, you know, possibly convert these licenses from unlimited to processor licenses, things like this might happen. This process is called certification and it happens when a ULA expires. Oracle has started putting into ULAs and well, anywhere they can, this little clause that says, by the way, if you're using a ULA, unlimited license amendment, uh, you know, an unlimited deployment right in AWS, that doesn't count. We're not gonna count that when we true up at the end of a ULA. We're gonna pretend that doesn't exist. And that can be very disadvantageous for a customer of Oracle's because if Oracle is saying, okay, well, ULA is over, let's convert all your licenses from this unlimited right to a discrete number of processor licenses that now you're going, we're going to hand to you and say, here's your processor licenses. If they don't count your public cloud usage and that's 90% of what you've got, then you might have signed on to this very expensive ULA and at the end of it they say, okay, and here's five or ten database licenses. By the way, now all the stuff you have in the cloud is running unlicensed and you'd better just shut it down immediately or we're going to come after you legally. Now, I don't think Oracle's really going to do that, but they could. And that's very dangerous. So if you are using an unlimited deployment right and you're going to Amazon, I would encourage you to very carefully check the paperwork you signed when you got that unlimited deployment right, that unlimited license amendment. Usually it's not too long and figure out if this applies to you or not. 
when you're doing your research on this Oracle contractual stuff, and again, I want to emphasize, if you look at the bottom here, I've said the cloud computing environment policy is not contractual. It's not. It has disclaimers. The entire agreement clause of the Oracle licensing master agreement you signed uh, excludes anything that's not there by direct reference. So either way you look at it, this isn't contractual, but it is respected. And there's a bunch of other documents that Oracle sometimes will give you and say, hey, you should read this. This is going to teach you how to do your cloud licensing. And these are not contractual documents. So you have to be careful about that. Now let's get into some sort of practical examples of how taking these principles we just talked about, that licensing is tied to processors, but processors are sort of the least important resource for a database system, and how licensing can be done with a cloud policy or at a physical hardware level. Let's see how those have practical implications in AWS. Uh, first thing, real quick, I'm going to talk about terms because this confuses a bunch of people. I've talked about Oracle licensing in AWS very generically, and I know a lot of people with a technical background or who have dipped a toe in this are saying, well, well, wait a second, Nick, there's two ways to run Oracle in AWS, and they're very different. And technically, they are different. You can run a, an EC2, and EC2 is just the standard compute service. You get a generic compute virtual machine. You install your operating system of choice. You configure it the way you want. You install Oracle just like you would on an on-premises system. Manage it like you would an on-premises system. It's just very traditional Oracle installation. Conversely, you can use a managed service, which in Amazon is RDS. Really good service. I really like uh, relational database service. That's more of a black box system where you just say, Amazon, please, may I have my R5 8x large with Oracle 19c on it? Click a few buttons. They provide it to you. But because it's a managed service, you can't really log on or tinker with the underlying operating system or any of these things. You can set some database parameters through the uh, graphical console or via APIs. But they really just want you interacting with the database layer, and they're providing the rest as sort of a black box solution. So given that these are very different technical solutions, the, you know, the question then that occurs to a lot of people is, what if I brought my own licenses? What if I'm using my own licenses? What, what is this RDS versus EC2? What does this mean to me? Here's the good news. They're licensed exactly the same if you're bringing your own licenses. You, you apply them via vCPUs or by you know, counting the, the number of vCPUs times um, divided by two for hyperthreading enabled. Sorry, I almost said times two. <laughs> That'd be worse, divided by two. Um, so they're very different technological approaches, but they're licensed the same. A lot of this stuff I'm going to talk about applies equally to both. So here's my first fun trick for reducing licensing costs dramatically. The feature that I'm going to talk about here is optimized CPU, and this is applicable to RDS or it's applicable to EC2. And this is a feature that lets you at RDS or EC2 instance creation time take the compute shape that you've picked away from its default CPU parameters. And this can be very, very powerful for licensing. The ability to enable and disable hyperthreading doesn't really move the needle very much. It, it's you know kind of cool for optimizing in certain circumstances. But the ability to reduce vCPU count away from what a compute shape should have by default is huge. This is huge for licensing. Because, hearkening back to my earlier comments, sometimes we want to give a system a lot of I.O., a lot of memory, and so we have to, we have to pick a very big compute shape. Um, I did this with a customer last year where we were looking, I think it was an i3EN24X large, just, just very large compute shape, but they really needed the memory and they really needed the I.O. bandwidth that it came with to make their database work. The problem, of course, is that this monster size instance had just huge piles of vCPUs. And so purchasing the Oracle processor licenses that you would need to license a compute shape that, that large was, was just insane. It was prohibitive. It was a huge, huge number. And I said, listen, guys, no, we're not picking this compute shape because we need this many vCPUs. We're picking this compute shape for RAM and I.O. bandwidth purposes. And what we're going to do is disable all but, I can't remember in this specific circumstance, I think it was either four or six 
of the available vCPUs. And this optimized CPU feature lets you do that. And it lets you do it in a way that is uh, what I call license reliable. It's not a setting that can be uh, turned on, turned off, flipped around, tinkered with at will, right? It is set at the time the compute instance is created and it is persistent until that compute instance is terminated. Shut down, restarts, it persists across all of that. So if you configure this feature and say, okay, I have you know, something that should have 48 vCPUs running, but I'm only running six and I created it that way, you can rely on the fact that, you know, even if you stop and restart it, um, or, or even if it gets stopped or restarted due to system faults or something like that on the AWS end, it's still not going to increase that vCPU number. It is not, it is not a user editable setting after instance creation, which means that when Oracle shows up and says, okay, it's time for a license audit, and you provide them the information that says, okay, I have this system that has six vCPUs, so I'm, I'm using three processor licenses of Oracle Database Enterprise Edition. And they go, well, wait, no, that, that compute shape should have 48. You can say, nope, configured it with six, right at instance creation. That's persistent. I cannot have modified it. Um, you know, this is what it is. Uh, and that's, that's very powerful. I, I use this all the time, and this is really the key to keeping your cloud licensing from ballooning out of control, is to not just take compute shapes um, as is, and then just think, oh, I just got to buy as many Oracle licenses as required, but actually do the math. And the math can be complicated. You, you have to look at performance trends and history and concurrency and amount of CPU use on your database platforms, but do the math, dig into all that rich data, and find out how many vCPUs you actually need. How are, what is the minimum number that lets your application and your database run well? And then use that and you will save, it is, it's very easy to start saving $100,000 here, $100,000 there on databases, considering the high price of Oracle licenses. So powerful technique and I encourage you to use it. The other option that I use sometimes, this one is a little bit more of a rare play, but you might wanna consider it. You have to have significant volume. This is a play for shops that have not just onesie twosie Oracle databases, but fleets of them, 20 here, 20 there, 40 here, 40 there, sort of thing. Instead of using the cloud policy, you could look at doing traditional hardware-based licensing in AWS. And a lot of people go, wait, didn't you just say you couldn't do that? Well, you normally can't because when you when you create an EC2 instance or an RDS instance, you know, you don't know what the underlying hardware is. You don't know where it is. You don't care. But for EC2, and this trick is applicable to EC2 only, unlike my previous one, if you have enough virtual machines or, or compute instances to justify it, you can rent entire hosts and make sure that your virtual machines, your compute instances, all run on certain dedicated hosts that you've rented from Amazon. When you approach it with this model, an interesting Oracle licensing possibility comes up. You can do hardware-based licensing again, like you used to do on-premises. So uh, the example diagram I did here was a C5, uh, not for any particular reason, just that was what I was thinking of when I made the diagram. But I show here that you know eight C5 2x large compute instances are all running on one C5 dedicated host. If I happen to need eight C5 2x large compute instances all hosting an Oracle database software stack, I could rent one host, look up the number of processor cores in a C5 dedicated host, and Amazon does publish this information. You can go look it up. License that many processor cores, so just count the processor cores. I know C5s are Intel, so processor cores present, divide by two, apply that number of processor license, and now I've licensed the whole hardware and so every virtual machine now is fully licensed for Oracle as well. And now I can get eight databases licensed, uh, eight database compute instances licensed by licensing that entire host. Uh, this, is, this is a play for volume. This can show some savings if you're big enough to saturate multiple dedicated hosts. Uh, I've occasionally had small shops say, hey, can we do this? We can just about fill up one dedicated host with database virtual machines. And I say, yeah, well, You've put all your eggs in one basket. It means you can't be multi-AZ, multi-region. Um, don't, don't approach this strategy unless you think you have enough database EC2 instances you know, to fill multiple dedicated hosts. But if you do, can be a great moneymaker. 
So I hope you got some really valuable lessons, uh, both for the concepts of Oracle licensing, how they apply to AWS, and some specific techniques for realizing those savings as you architect your workloads in AWS. Uh, really appreciated you watching the video and stay tuned for more of our content.